Good evening, everyone from Texas. We are deeply honored to be in the presence of a shepherd after the heart of Jesus, our chief shepherd. He was born in Honolulu and his family has been in Hawaii for about 150 years. But when he was a year old, his parents moved to California where he grew up in the Bay Area. He became a priest of the Diocese of Auckland in 1975 and served there for 30 years before being ordained a bishop and installed as Bishop of Honolulu by Pope Benedict XVI on July 21st, 2005 at the Neil Blaisdell Arena in Honolulu. By the way, for the information of everybody, the Diocese of Honolulu covers all the Hawaiian islands. Hawaii Catholics welcome a man known to be a great priest, an experienced pastor, and a man of, of integrity. Bishop Silva has engaged Hawaii's Catholics in a journey to accomplish a mission, a mission to give witness to Jesus, not just an Episcopal motto, witness to Jesus has become a roadmap by which the diocese operates and fuels the infrastructure. He chose his motto, he said, because he is, and I quote, convinced that our faith and our church will be renewed to the extent that all our programs, structures, and institutions can be more focused on the fact that Jesus Christ is not just a figure of past history, but is alive and active among us now. I want to be his witness and encourage others to witness to him as well." Unquote. We would like to inform you to your Excellency that the mission and vision of our community, the missionary families of Christ, is very much aligned to your pastoral vision and mission plans in Honolulu. We will be so happy to serve you and your people. Brothers and sisters, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Bishop Larry Silva of the Honolulu Diocese. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is great to be with you. I thank you for that introduction. Um, I presume you can all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, so the, our, my diocese here includes all of the islands. So I happen to be on the island of Hawaii right now doing various things. And uh, I very near where the volcano erupted several years ago. So it's good to be here with you, uh, wherever you are. And uh, yes, we are in Lent and therefore uh, the preparations for Easter are uh, getting more earnest as we come to Holy Week. So I wanted to 
do a couple of reflections. Uh, so uh, before I do, however, if I may do this, I would like to uh, give a shout out to my friend, uh, Father Eric Villa, who is in his last uh, night as a young adult, because tomorrow he turns 40. So happy birthday, Father Eric. Now, um, I wanted to read from the Gospel of Luke. This is year C in our lectionary, and we read the Gospel of Luke. So this Sunday, we'll be reading the Passion from Luke. So I wanted to uh, read uh, this section from uh, Luke 23 and going into chapter 24. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because an e of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion who witnessed what had happened glorified God and said, this man was innocent beyond doubt. When all the people who had gathered for this spectacle saw what had happened, they returned home beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances stood at a distance, including the women who had followed him from Galilee and saw these events. Then moving to chapter 24. But at daybreak, on the first day of the week, they took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were puzzling over this, Behold, two men in dazzling garments appeared to them. They were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. They said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. The Gospel of the Lord. Some time ago, I made a 30-day uh, retreat according to the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius. And one of the things I learned in that retreat was that uh, prayer, in prayer, it's good sometimes to use your imagination. Uh, you try to imagine yourself in a place at a particular time and imagine that you are with the scene in the, the gospel. And uh, so I'd like to do that a little bit today, to invite you to use your imaginations to uh, imagine the first Holy Saturday, the time between the death of Jesus and his resurrection. So that was, you know, from late Friday night until uh, early Sunday morning. So what happened during that time? And, uh, you know, think of yourself as uh, one of the disciples of Jesus gathered perhaps in the upper room uh, with the other disciples of Jesus. And remember now, this was a, a holy day. This was the Sabbath uh, during the Passover and during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it was a very holy day and they didn't work they were all gathered together to celebrate that, uh, that feast. And imagine 
what they must have been talking about, what they must have felt. Perhaps you have been in a situation where somebody has, uh, that you love has recently died and uh, you know that there is grief and sorrow, there are tears, uh, there are, you know, if only I had done this, uh, maybe uh, this person would not have died, or uh, if only I had noticed this or done that. Uh, we kind of uh, blame ourselves in a, in a way, uh, but I'm sure that that must have been part of their conversation. Um, you know, just, just crying, weeping that this person that they admired and loved and followed was dead and, and had suffered such a cruel and horrible and uh, shameful death, really. And so, um, you know, that, that must have been a great struggle for them. But um, wonder too, if some of them maybe did remember Jesus' predictions about resurrection. And perhaps there were arguments among them saying, no, get real, it's over. You know, he said he'd rise from the dead, but has that happened? Uh, you know, he's, he's dead. Let's, let's accept that and get over it. And what are we going to do now? You know, he taught us many good things. Uh, and certainly we want to live out those things. But, um, you know, we, we're not going to be his followers anymore because he's gone. Uh, so what do we do? Go back to fishing, go back to tax collecting, go back to you know, whatever we were doing. So uh, I don't know, can, can we get back into these professions? Can I, uh, you know, make a profit again as a, as a fisherman or uh, what, what'll happen now? I, I kind of turned away from tax collecting and now I don't know what to do. Uh, so uh, there was, I'm sure a lot of that, you know, confusion, uh, about the future, what's going to happen now. Uh, there was probably some fear because these were the disciples of a man who had been crucified and we kn they knew that the same could happen to them, that they could be hunted down as disciples of Jesus and also persecuted and put to death. And so, uh, on top of their grief, there was this uh, fear. Um, and of course, there was uh, some guilt, I'm sure. Um, certainly, uh, Peter must have felt a lot of guilt that he had denied the Lord three times, even though he had sworn up and down that he would never do that, that he would be with him to the death, but no, when the chips were down, Peter denied him three times, just as the Lord had predicted. How terrible he must have felt. And perhaps um, the others were trying to console Peter uh, with uh, his, uh, the struggles that he was having over that uh, betrayal of the Lord. Uh, but maybe the others were being realistic too and saying, well, you know, Peter, at least you were there uh, and, you know, were close enough to, to be asked about him. We, we were not. We, we split the scene as soon as we could because it was just too dangerous for us. So, even though you may have denied him three times, at least you were there to do so. Um, and we feel very badly that we didn't even do that. Uh, we just left him, we abandoned him. Um, you know, maybe part of that for Peter and James and John who were 
kind of Jesus special friends, whereas, you know, he asked us to pray for him. He asked us to be with him and we fell asleep. You know, like, what, what's that about? Uh, maybe they were talking about Judas and, uh, you know, trying to deal with Judas and make sense of this because apparently at the Last Supper, when Jesus said one of them was going to betray him, they didn't know who it was. So it wasn't obvious that Judas was, uh, you know, that insidious, that, that he was that bad, because uh, they didn't know. Uh, it wasn't, you know, clear that it was going to be Judas who was the betrayer. And so they, they perhaps had to deal with that. How, how could we not have known? There was this hint, there was that hint. Wasn't he stealing some money? I was suspected that. Um, and, uh, you know, what about when he, uh, you know, that woman was anointing Jesus' feet and, and Judas got all upset about that and saying that money should have been used for the, the poor uh, instead of uh, the oil, that expensive oil being poured out on Jesus. Uh, on the other hand, you know, Ju Judas had committed suicide, and this was one of their brothers. This was one of their fellow disciples, and uh, what grief there must have been about that, too. So not only was there Jesus' death to deal with, but there was Judas's death. And maybe some felt, well, good riddance to him, but maybe some didn't. Maybe some felt real uh, concern for Judas and uh, what he had done and why he had done it. And maybe even some guilt about, hey, is it I, Lord? Could I have been the one to have done that? Um, so I, I think those are other things that perhaps they were dealing with. Maybe they were thinking about some of the things that Jesus said when he was on the cross, like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Or uh, to the thief, this day you will be with me in paradise. Like, how could he be so incredibly forgiving when they were being so cruel to him. That just blows my mind. It's it just is so hard to grasp how he could do that. But it, that's what he said, you know. Or maybe they were scandalized by um, the words that he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, and thought, you know, why couldn't he have saved himself? He saved others. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised that uh, young girl from the dead. He raised the widow of name from the dead. So why couldn't he have saved himself? What was that about? And, you know, has, did he give up on faith saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then perhaps another pointed out, well, wait a minute. If you look at Psalm 22, those are the first words of Psalm 22, but the rest of the Psalm is very hopeful. And in fact, if we look at that Psalm, it talks about death and, uh, you know, the, the servant of God giving his life and uh, uh, the not a bone being broken and uh, they're uh, casting lots for his clothes and so on. And, and yet it ends so um, hopefully. So maybe Jesus was just starting to recite that Psalm and then he just didn't have the energy to go on, but wanted us to look at that because it's, it said something about what he was doing. Um, maybe uh, there was uh, um, a, a scandal about how Jesus uh, 
could have uh, let that happen to him. And so I think all of these things are things that we might imagine very fruitfully on uh, about the first Holy Saturday. Scriptures don't say anything about it directly, but we can connect the dots. And I think it's important for us to connect the dots because don't we always feel that same way? Don't we have times when we feel, I've betrayed Jesus, I've let him down? Don't we have times when we wonder, Jesus, why aren't you taking charge of this? Why aren't you doing something that I, I know needs to be done or I want to be done, a healing that I want for myself or somebody I love? Uh, sometimes we... Uh, we struggle with our faith, you know, that uh, it's not always uh, something we want to sing about, especially when we're challenged in that faith, when people persecute us, when they put us down, uh, when they uh, crucify us. Maybe we're afraid sometimes, uh, just as those apostles were afraid. Um, maybe we struggle with forgiveness. Uh, and wonder how Jesus could be for, so forgiving when, uh, you know, this person has hurt me so much, and I don't know how I could ever forgive what has been done. And so I think it, it, it's uh, this kind of a imaginative prayer that is based on the scriptures. You know, we have to, to keep those, the word of God, as, as our, uh, our basis. But not everything that God wants us to pray about is right there directly in the scriptures. And I think we can very fruitfully use our imaginations to, to, uh, to wonder what were they thinking during this time between the resurrection uh, or the, uh, the death of Jesus and the resurrection. What were they thinking about what he did at the Last Supper? And what connection did it have? This is my body, which is given for you. They must have struggled with that. What did he mean by that? Uh, what, what could he possibly have meant? And because it really didn't become clear until he rose from the dead. And in that breaking of the bread, then they recognized him. And so I think all of these things are struggles that we have, uh, and uh, it's okay for us to have those struggles because uh, when we do, we bring them to the Lord and it is he who guides us and takes us to the empty tomb and to those angels who announce good news and who uh, give us reason for hope. So I thank you for, for that. And I think we're going to have a little uh, time for reflection in groups, I believe. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I hope your discussions were, were fruitful provided further insights on our first half of this evening. Um, we, so before we jump in back with uh, Bishop Silva, um, we will be having a question and answer uh, portion after with the Bishop. So if you guys have any questions as we go through, just make a little note um, so we, you will have it ready for our question all right, just our open dialogue after the second part of tonight's recollection. So we'll welcome back. Without further ado, Bishop Silva. Thank you very much. Um, so the, uh, the second reflection I have is, um, takes us to after the resurrection. 
and maybe seeing things in a different way, uh, using our imagination again uh, to a certain extent, but um, noticing things in the scriptures that maybe we don't always notice. Um, so, and I think what my, my overall theme about this is I have noticed how playful Jesus is after the resurrection. Uh, you know, he seems to be like a trickster uh, or playing, playing with people, teasing them. Uh, and so I just wanted to go through a few scenes where I think that happens. Um, I've had the privilege of going to Jerusalem to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which is, of course, is where Jesus was buried and from which he rose. Uh, but there is a painting in the, uh, the church there near this tomb, but it's kind of an obscure place. I, I'm willing to bet that most people don't even pay attention to it. Uh, but I think it's a, a fascinating picture because you remember the scene where Jesus is meeting Mary Magdalene outside the tomb and she is weeping and uh, she's, he appears and she thinks he's the gardener. And so she says, uh, you know, please, if you've taken him away, let me know where, and I'll, I'll take him, take his body away. And uh, so in this picture in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Jesus is standing in front of her, but he's wearing this dirty tunic. He has a floppy hat on his head, and he has a hole over his shoulder. And so she thinks he's the gardener because he looks like the gardener, you know. Now, I was, I was pointing out, uh, that out to somebody who was in our group, and she said, well, you know, he didn't have any clothes on, so maybe he just found the gardener's clothes and put them on. Uh, and so she thought he was the gardener. So, but uh, I think it was uh, an indication that Jesus was playing with her, you know, that he, he was, he knew who she was, she knew who he was, but he somehow disguised himself uh, to, to spring upon her this good news that he was risen from the dead. Um, and then you can imagine Mary Magdalene just clinging to him because she's so thrilled that this person that she loves and thought was dead is now alive and now she's just hugging him and kissing him and and Jesus says oh don't cling to me you know you got work to do and uh, you know so it's not like don't touch me so much as don't cling to me because you have to go and tell my my friends that uh, I'm risen from the dead so go uh, and I think sometimes we try to cling to Jesus rather than go out and tell the good news because we'd just rather be just with Jesus because he's more comforting. Um, I think of uh, the, uh, the scene with Thomas, and we're all familiar with that. We'll be hearing it the, the uh, Sunday after Easter. So Thomas is not there when Jesus appears to the apostles on the first day of his resurrection. And of course, the, the others tell him about it. And he says, no, give me a break, guys. You know, I'm not that stupid. I'm not that naive to think that Jesus has risen from the dead. So, you know, please. Uh, then Thomas goes and here's Jesus. And I can imagine Jesus just saying to him, Tom, how are you doing? Nice to see you. 
come over here. Here are my hands. Put your fingers in. Here are my side. Put your finger in. I mean, just very playfully, uh, you know, encountering Thomas and uh, kind of breaking his, uh, his doubt in that way. I think of uh, um, the uh, scene of the disciples going to Emmaus. And these are disciples, remember, so they knew Jesus. They, he was not a stranger to them, but um, they didn't recognize him. They're walking almost seven miles and in the, in the daylight, and they don't recognize him. Um, but then he asks, oh, are you the only one who doesn't know what happened in Jerusalem these days? And he goes, oh, what things? Oh, about Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, well, let me tell you a few things that I know about it, you know. Uh, so you, you can just imagine his playfulness there kind of teasing them and, and knowing that he's going to reveal himself, uh, but doing that, of course. And then he breaks the bread and they recognize him and he disappears. And then they run back to Jerusalem to tell everybody else and everybody else already knows because he's already been there, you know. So, um, you know, just these amusing things, I think. I think of the scene where uh, Jesus is, uh, uh, well, the, the seven disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee fishing, and uh, he comes to them, and uh, he's on the shore, and they say, have you caught anything? Um, no, we haven't caught anything. We've been working hard. No. Well, Put your nets out and you'll find a few fish. So they put the nets out and they have this wonderful catch. Now, this is from uh, John chapter 21, verses 7 to 8. And, you know, again, you have to mute your imagination, but the scripture does say Peter was lightly clad or uh, was uh, he had his clothes off. So in other words, it must have been very hot. And so Peter was probably in the boat with his shirt off and, uh, you know, just enjoying the sun. Then it says, once the beloved disciple said, it's the Lord, Peter puts all his clothes on and jumps in the water. So you can imagine, you know, the, the, the funny scene there, you know, because most people, when they go swimming, they take their clothes off. But Peter put his clothes on to go swimming. And here's what I imagine he was doing. Um, when, you know, he felt so bad about betraying the Lord or denying the Lord that... Um, you know, he said, oh, I'm going to show him how faithful I am, how much I really believe in him, and I'm going to put on my clothes, and I'm going to walk to him across the water. So he puts on all his clothes and gets in the water, and of course he sinks, and I can imagine Jesus just laughing his head off at this scene, Peter. And then it says, the other disciples came in the boat. Duh, they were they were a little smarter than Peter. Uh, they figured, yeah, boat, water, we can use the boat. We don't need to, to get in the water. Uh, so, but uh, all these things that that I think you can miss if uh, if you're not paying attention. So I think there's there's. Uh, something about uh, listening to Jesus and especially watching him after the resurrection. I think before the resurrection, he can be a pretty serious guy. But after the resurrection, I find 
uh, there are many places where he is just very playful and uh, uh, almost teasing uh, to his disciples. And, uh, and I think that there's a joy in that. There is something that, uh, you know, when we get together, we can be playful with one another. Now, of course, you know, we can go over overboard with that and hurt people. But, uh, you know, sometimes good, good teasing and, and uh, uh, you know, having fun with one another is really what brings joy to our lives and uh, uh, helps us realize uh, that, that God wants us to live joyfully. And so I, I hope that uh, as we celebrate Easter, you'll think of these uh, little scenarios of, of how these things happen and uh, you know how Jesus really was very playful with his disciples, especially after the resurrection, and wants to be playful with us too, because we're his disciples and uh, he is risen from the dead. And sometimes, uh, uh, you know, it takes that playfulness to help us really understand that he is with us. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Bishop, for sharing those kind words. Um, definitely a different take on his resurrection, because I think of like Jesus and all of his glory and being, you know, in awe of him. And then you spin it in a way where it's like we have to understand this joy of being with one another and, and being very playful with the disciples. So thank you for that insight. Um, Thank you so much. So, well, thank you once again, Bishop, for providing us these beautiful reflections for the Lenten season. I know that for myself personally, it was refreshing to hear a different take on how to really um, appreciate the resurrection of Christ and his playfulness um, yeah. his encounters. So that is really awesome. Um, so if, if possible, Bishop, would it be possible to get a blessing from you so that we can all pray Absolutely. together? Yes. So let me uh, give you one of my favorite blessings, which is from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that he may grant you in accord with the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self and that Christ may dwell in you, in your hearts through faith, that you rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the holy ones what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to accomplish far more than all we ask or imagine by the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Amen. And thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, many blessings to you during Holy Week and Easter. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you very thank much, you. Bishop. Thank and you, Father. Thank you, Father. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. 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 Hello. 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 Th